Well, good morning. good morning. I'm glad you were here. Um, about a month ago, I was over in the parking lot here where the Culver's is, and, and I was looking for the Union Bank, and I was, um, I was confused. And I thought, I don't know where it is. I was in the parking lot, and I thought, oh, I got to go right. So I get to the corner, and I turn right, but I didn't look at the car that was coming. And I hear this noise, and the next thing, that car's in front of me, and there's a big scrape down inside. Unknowingly, I had driven into that car's space, and, and we had a conflict. What a conflict. I want to show you what the conflict looked like. Uh, that's his car. Uh, that's the passenger side. And then here's my car. It's going to be fixed tomorrow. That, that's my side. It's going to be fixed. That's the the driver's side, a little, 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 little ding, little ding there. Isn't that how conflict goes, though, sometimes? You know, you, you have conflict unresolved, and it leaves you scratched, doesn't it? It leaves you bruised. It leaves you hurt. Fortunately, we were driving slow enough, no one was physically hurt in this accident, but uh, when it's personal conflict and the, the hurts are there, sometimes, sometimes they stay with us. And this morning, I want us to think about what is the result of unresolved conflict? So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to Genesis 37, we're going to go all the way through this chapter, and we're going to, to wrestle with this question of what is the impact of this unresolved conflict? What's the impact of unresolved conflict? conflict. Our passage opens this way. Now, Jacob, so, so we are getting back into the book of Genesis, and we've worked our way through it, and God, 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11, uh, Genesis, he creates humanity. Humanity pushes back, said, I want anything to do with you, and God says, well, I'm going to start, I'm going to show myself, and he picks a happy pagan named Abraham, who is probably worshiping the moon god, and he says, I, I'm going to go into a covenant with you, but you're going to have to trust me. And they take him to another land, and, and they don't have a son, and finally they get a son. And that son's name was Isaac. And Isaac got married, and, and his, he and his wife had twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger, and God chose to work through him. And then Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter, and these 12 sons would be the 12 tribes of Israel. So that, that's the progression here. So we're to the Fourth generation, Jacob is the third and his kids. So that's, that's just a quick overview. It says, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, one of his sons, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So I need to set the stage. If you think you have a dysfunctional family, uh, yours is not the most dysfunctional. Jacob, when he decided he wanted to get married, he was living in uh, what is now modern-day Israel. And he had to go back to his people, which is southern Iraq. And he, he meets this uncle named Laban. And he sees Rachel, and he falls in love with Rachel. Um, and he says, I'll work seven years. But then Laban pulls the old switcheroo and he, and he gives him his older daughter, Leah. And Jacob wakes up the night after and finds out, oh, I'm married to Leah. So you got to, okay, you can have Rachel. Now you got two, but you got to work another seven years. So, so they get into this and, and, and Leah, kind of the unloved woman, she's able to have children. Rachel is not, and, and Rachel's frustrated. So she wants Joseph to have a surrogate child. So she gives him her servant, Bilhah. And Joseph's able to have, or Jacob's able to have children with her. Leah is done. Apparently, her womb is closed. And, and she's jealous. So she gives Jacob her servant, Zilpah. So those are the names. So, so just so you got this, Jacob's, he's having women, by, our children, by three different women. And the fourth is the wife he loves most. And her name is Rachel. And she's been barren. Until finally, they're able to conceive a child. And that child is Joseph. And Joseph, as we find out, is a favorite son. Verse 3, now Israel, that's 
Jacob's name. Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. So he's got a favorite son. He's got 12 sons. Uh, later, he has another son named Benjamin by Rachel. But, but 10 of them are on the outs. They're, they're not the favorite. And, and, and so Jacob's out, uh, Joseph's out pastoring with them and, and he brings back a bad report about the sons of the, these servants. Well, that doesn't play very well. In verse 4, his brothers saw that their father loved him, him being Joseph more than all his brothers. So they hated him. They could not speak to him on friendly terms. They can't even say, hey, how are you? A lot of us did that. Hey, good morning. Good to see you this morning. We couldn't do that. The hate was so bad. Couldn't do that. Now, now many of us are parents in here. You know, the idea of having an obvious favorite, that, that's not going to play well with the other kids. That, that's bad parenting. Um, and so it sets up a militant family. Joseph shows himself not to be very astute. Uh, verses 5 through 8. Then Joseph had a dream. Now, in these days, God often communicated with his people through dreams. So he has this dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Why? He said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered and bowed down to my sheaf. So this is a picture of you're going to be bowing down to me. And the brothers take umbrage with that. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? That's a rhetorical question. And that's a foreshadowing. Do you know what the answer to that question is? Yes. Yes. Are you really going to rule over us? Yeah. So, they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Joseph, God's communicating with you. He's giving you a vision of the future. And, and when you, we find out what happens here, we'll understand why God's giving Joseph these dreams. He wants him to know my hand's still on you. But why? Why are you communicating these dreams to your brother? Why do they need to know? I mean, Joseph's a little bit, remember, I mean, we're, okay, so many of us watched the Huskers yesterday or watched the NFL, and man, if a guy makes a play, what does he do? He, he makes a sack, he gets out, and he's, you know, he's kind of playing the crowd. Cheer for me here. Or he puts it on Facebook. I don't know. But Joseph's out there. Man, I got position. I got place. That isn't helping him with his brothers. Second dream. Now he had still another dream. And related to his brothers and said, Lo, I've had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. Again, he tells others. He related to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? Yeah. You're going to. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Anybody ever dealt with jealousy? Okay, you haven't, but you've had friends, haven't you? You've had friends who have dealt with that. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Being jealous of someone, and you got to cover it. A lot of times you got to show it. So, yeah, oh, man, I, I won this award, or my kid, maybe it doesn't bother us, but your kid's doing better than my kid. My kid got first place. My kid got that. And, and what we do is, man, that is so good. That's so, so good. But inside, we're dying. Why? Because they got something we want in terms of recognition or popularity or money. Position. Man, Joseph's got, he's got their father's love, and now apparently he's got position, and yeah, the brothers are jealous. And then his brothers, verse 12, went to the pasture of their father's flock in Shechem. 
Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers passing the flock and check? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. I'll let you read verses 15 to 17 on your own. Um, Joseph gets some direction on how to find his brothers. And so he's got them. And and in verse 18, he starts approaching. When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. That's a derisive term. The dreamer. Let's show the dreamer who's in control. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. Can you hear the anger? Let's see how these dreams play out. If he's dead. If he's chewed up by one another, let's see how far the dreamer gets. Let's see how much we bow down to him. But Reuben, the oldest, heard this and rescued him out of their hands. Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into the pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. That he might, and he's, Reuben said they might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brother, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. They took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. So apparently they're going to leave him to die of dehydration, starvation. I don't know. Then they sat down to eat a meal. How callous. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. So they're going to leave him. But then Judah, one of the brothers, he's an entrepreneur. He sees an opportunity to make money. So here's what he says. Verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is for us to kill him? Fellas, we're talking about money. And cover up his blood. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. Here's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. You see what unresolved conflict will do you? Do you see what happens? When jealousy goes unchecked, selling your brother into slavery. A few weeks ago, we jumped ahead into Genesis 38. So they're going to, Joseph sold into slavery. We go back, and Judah, who has shown himself to be a poor character, uh, doesn't care for his daughter in law forces her to go into prostitution, ends up taking up with her as a prostitute. And when it comes to times to judge him, she had taken his staff and his ring as kind of payment. And so when she's being brought out, um, she says, here's the man who impregnated me. And Judah realizes that that's me. That's, that's my stuff. And he turns. He's confronted with his sin. And, and God works in his life. And what we talked about is that Judah is the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. He's listed in the genealogy of Jesus. So it's no one is beyond redemption. But if you're sitting here thinking, you know, I don't know what I'm doing in church and I don't know why I'm even thinking about God because God is really into good people. No, 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 he's not. These are the patriarchs. These are the leaders of Israel. These are the 12 tribes. And they're willing to throw their brother in a pet. Before, they got talked out of feeding him to an animal. Leave him for dehydration. No, no, no. We've got a chance to make some money off him. These were men who were in need of the grace of God. Like you and like me. Please don't tell me, Andy, I'm beyond the grace of God. No, you're not. Neither am I. It's good news. The grace of God is deeper than our deepest sin. Because this is pretty bad. 
But it's a warning to us when we let conflict go unresolved, when we let jealousy go unchecked, when we let anger go undealt with, it takes us to places we don't necessarily want to go. Uh, Verse 29, then, now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He turned to his brother and said, the boy is not here. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic, and they slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And then they sent the very colored tunic and, and, and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether it's your son's tunic or not. How, how bad has this gotten? You sell your brother into slavery, and you kill an animal, and you, you fake out your dad. You're lying to your father, but I guess he deserves it, doesn't it? Because he had a favorite son, and we weren't it. Don't deal with conflict. We let it go. It takes us to some wild places. Then he, Jacob, examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast had devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, a sign of grief, of wailing, of, and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his son for many days. And of all the stuff that goes on in this chapter, here's the verse that gets to me. It's verse 35. Ready? Then all the sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in the morning for my son. So his father wept for him. Can you imagine Can you imagine? You just sold the guy's son to slavery. You faked his death by killing a male goat and sprinkled blood on his clothing. And he's weeping and grieving. And you have the gall to comfort him. What's the deal with these brothers, with these sons? Man, rage and anger. It's gone unchecked. It's unresolved. So I want to ask you, uh, we've got basically three parties here, roughly. We've got Jacob the father, Joseph the favorite son, and the other 11 brothers. Unresolved conflict. Who won? Who won in that? Was Jacob a winner? No. Joseph? No. The brothers, we're going to find out as we go through this, they are plagued by what they've done. Who won? Nobody. Nobody won. Not maybe some lost bigger than others. So we're asking this question, what is the impact of unresolved conflict? Here's the deal, everybody loses. Everybody loses. And you know, sometimes we're real good, at least I'm real good at at, uh, hiding what I feel, the conflict in my heart. And uh, on the outside, man, I'm looking good. I'm looking good. But on the inside, I'm, I'm angry. When I was a junior in high school, we moved from suburban Chicago to suburban Houston. And honestly, I went from the top of the social heap. I felt like I knew all 2,000 people in that high school in suburban Chicago. I moved to Houston. I didn't know anybody. I was, I was at the bottom of the social ladder. And, and I found out in Texas, beginning of my senior year, I mean, the, the football rules, the social structure is built around the football players and the cheerleaders and the, the, the um, drill team. And I wasn't on the football team. And, and man, I felt it. And they had a pep rally every Friday for the football team. I had a physics teacher who told us, we're not doing anything on Friday, because he was a coach, don't you know? He was thinking about the game. Man, we saw our stadium set, 16,000 high school. And I thought, boy, we're going to be state-of-the-art. Uh-uh, we were just keeping up with the Joneses. And there'd be a pep rally, and people would be cheering. And you know what? In my heart, I I mean, I'm cheering. I'm five fair Bobcats, Bobcats fight, blah, 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 blah. But you know what I'm thinking in my heart? I hope they lose. I hope they lose. That's what I thought. I smile on the inside. Why? They had what I wanted. They had popularity. They had. Pers- I didn't even know the guys on the team. 
Never had a conversation with him. But I wanted to lose unresolved conflict in my heart. Who's losing? I am. I am. This is an unresolved conflict. There's one more verse here, though, in this chapter. It's verse 36. Meanwhile, okay, this is what's going on here. This is what's going on in Israel. Meanwhile, in Egypt, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officers, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And you come back in the next few weeks, you won't believe what happens here. I mean, it's, it, goes, it gets worse for Joseph. But long story short, he will interpret some dreams and he will rise to a position of leadership after going through a whole lot. And this family will be on the brink of starvation. And they will come and bow down to him without knowing who he is because they need food. The purposes of God are never thwarted. Is this an unresolved conflict? Is this something we want to model? Absolutely not. But the good news is, what about unresolved conflict? Everybody loses, but God still moves his purposes forward through the unresolved conflict. I don't want to paint a pretty picture of unresolved conflict. It's ugly. You take a hit, just like those two cars. You and I, we take a hit. But we can despair. But the good news is, God moves his purposes forward through unresolved conflict. Conflict. That being said, uh, we have a responsibility as much as we can to resolve conflict. Romans 12, 18 says this. If possible, and we need that qualifier, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If possible, do what you can to be at peace with all men. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with your conflict. And, and maybe you've done it. And maybe you've tried everything. And, and if that's the case, I, I get it. I, I understand. I've got those relationships in my life. But I'm asking you, is there anything you can do to resolve that conflict? Because as long as it goes, you take a hit, they take a hit. Those people take a hit. At the crucifixion, uh, that was driven by, by anger. Jesus didn't, Jesus' death, it, they didn't, Jesus didn't come through for the people. They wanted to liberate from Rome. He didn't do it. They were angry. It was driven by jealousy. He threatened the Jewish leadership. He was becoming very popular. It was motivated by fear. Pilate, the, the Roman prefect, thought this, this crowd's getting out of hand. So together, they, Let, let's crucify this. Jesus absorbed all that. The, he took all that on when he went to the cross, and he died for that. And he empowers us to be peacemakers. And I understand sometimes there's stuff on the other side that, that you can't resolve it. I, I get that. But he's empowered us to be people who step into it and say, is there anything we can do? Because in conflict, unresolved, we all lose. The hope is, no matter what happens in the conflict, God moves his purposes forward. For that reason, we can be people who hope. We can be people who never lose heart. About a year ago, 18 months ago, I was walking through the library. Sometimes I'll just go to see if there's anything I want to read. And, and this was a, a Ken Burns special. He had done a, a HBO special on the Vietnam War. And I was born in 1960, so the Vietnam War was going on. I remember it when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I, I picked up the book. I, I was fascinated with it. Uh, when I was in the fourth grade, my teacher had a son who led a night patrol in Vietnam. And I went to school every day afraid that I was going to hear that he had died. Um, we had a... a I didn't know him, but somebody a block over and two streets down who went down a helicopter and died in Vietnam. And, and I remember the protests, and I remember 
all that stuff. And, and so I, I, was, I was curious. And I got about a third of the way through the book, and it, it was interesting. It profiled American families. It profiled South, South Vietnam families. It profiled North Vietnamese families. And, and about a third of the way through, I, I, I just, I stopped reading. I put this down. You know what? I thought, nobody won. <laughs> Some lost bigger than others. I just couldn't handle it. I just, I'm taking this back. I, I don't, I, it's just, it was a conflict that, that just, every, some lost bigger than others, but everybody lost. And that's how conflicts that are unresolved go outside of the will of God. The good news is we follow a Savior who stepped into conflict and he took it on and he empowers us to do that. And so we can be peacemakers. We can, as much as it depends on us, we, we can be at peace with people. But even when our efforts empowered by God don't fail, we are people who have hope. This was an ugly conflict. This was really ugly. But God saved his people through it. God works his purposes, yes, even through unresolved conflict. For that reason, we're people of hope. We're going to move to a time of communion now. So if you're a person who's serving at a table or a couple who's serving at a table, if you would step up and do that. But we are um, celebrating, remembering this Jesus. Because we can't preach this kind of message that God is in control and, and offers hope in the midst of conflict unless there was someone who took on the sin of the world. And so what we're doing as we break the bread and, and share the juice is, is we're remembering Jesus because his body was broken for us and his blood was shed. We don't become, believe this becomes a little body and blood of Jesus, but we believe it is a, a significant solemn ceremony in which we remember him who died for us to give us this kind of hope even in the midst of unresolved conflict. So here's the deal. After I pray... Uh, I, I'd like us to split these sections. If you go to these tables, um, the two end sections, if you go to the far tables, that would be great. You do not have to be a member of North Point Community Church to partake in communion. We just ask that you be a follower of Jesus, that you ask that you be a believer in Christ. If you're not sure what that means, please, please feel free to watch. No need to be embarrassed. Um, and like I said, after I pray, uh, we'll go up and, and what we're doing is we're remembering, we're uh, memorializing this Jesus and, and the, the body, the bread and, and the juice are, are symbolic of his body and his blood broken and shed for us. So before we take communion, uh, uh, how are you doing in your relationships? I think we measure our Christian faith in our relationships. Now, all of us probably have conflict of some sort. Have you done everything you can? To resolve that. And I know some of us live with conflict that's, that's not healed. Are you still a person of hope? Knowing that this is not God's desire or God's best. That his purposes still move forward in those resolved conflict. Let me pray. And then we can remember this magnificent Jesus together. So Jesus it is uh, in your name that we come. Um, realizing we're broken people and and we live for self instead of for others. And, and as a result, there, there's conflict. And um, you, you took on the conflict of the world at the cross. And, and you've empowered us to be peacemakers. Uh, and yet sometimes it's, it's hard. And, and the brokenness conflict doesn't get resolved. Thank you that we have hope even in that unresolved conflict. Thanks for what you did in Joseph's life. And, and the hate and the animosity of his brothers. How you brought beauty out of those ashes. Thank you that you're never out of control. And we remember you in Jesus' name. Amen.